Good evening and welcome to ABN's Jihad Watch program. I am Robert Spencer and we continue yet again this week with our series of interviews with some of the nation's prominent and foremost freedom fighters. I'm very happy to say that we have with us again tonight Raymond Ibrahim, the author of The Al-Qaeda Reader and of the brand new book Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians, which is available now at any self-respecting bookstore and at Amazon.com. Raymond, of course, is a Middle East and Islam specialist, a showman fellow with the David Horowitz Freedom Center, associate fellow at the Middle East Forum. He has given lectures all over the country at the National Defense Intelligence Conference, the U.S. Strategic Command, the Defense Intelligence Agency. He's got a rap sheet as long as your arm. And we are very happy to have him with us tonight. Raymond, welcome. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me. Happy to be with you again. Indeed. It's my pleasure. And uh, Raymond, this book that you have, Crucified Again, this is an extremely important topic. And uh, I uh, think that it cannot be emphasized enough how important this is. Uh, the Muslim persecution of Christians is something that is escalating all over the world today. It is getting very scant attention from the uh, political authorities, from the mainstream media, from the human rights organizations and yet it is uh, really reaching epidemic proportions. Can you give us a little capsule uh, summary just to begin with of uh, the kinds of things that are happening in the world today that I think most people are not aware of? Sure, uh, everything you say is absolutely correct. Uh, this, uh, this matter of Muslim persecution of Christians is really one of, it's, it's, a, it's a humanitarian crisis at this point. And it's something that, as you pointed out, is little known of, little heard of, little acted upon. And in fact, uh, as we talk, we, you'll see how even the Obama administration, not only is it, is it ignoring it, but it's actually exacerbating it and making it worse, a la the Arab Spring and other matters. But uh, it, it's, the, it's the amazing thing is, as you're alluding to, is how the mainstream media has all but obfuscated and just made it in, into a non-issue. Um, and of course, the reason for that is because this is one of those things that will really, really, really throw a wrench in the uh, liberal mainstream narrative, the philosophical narrative. In other words, uh, you know, when we talk about violence, when you look at the TV and the mainstream media and the way it's always presented, violence and anger and hostility must always be rationalized as some sort of grievance. Some, uh, it's a lack of education. It's ignorance. It's, uh, you know poverty, um, it's, it's any number of things because that's the mainstream narrative. It can't be some sort of intrinsic thing. It can't be evil because, of course, we don't believe in that sort of thing. That's very antiquated to talk about such things. And so when you talk about Muslim persecution of Christians, unlike any other form of uh, Muslim intolerance, it's, it really stands out because if Muslims uh, you know, launch rockets at Israel, and scream Allah Akbar, if Muslims riot in Europe and burn and destroy, if Muslims do any number of thing, that's easy for the mainstream media and you know all the pundits, the liberal ones to get by because it'll always be articulated as a matter of just oppressed, angry Muslims lashing out and who can blame them? They're so frustrated in Israel. Obviously Israel is stronger than uh, Palestinians, so they have no recourse but to uh, resort to terrorism and, and violence. In Europe, Muslims are minorities. Obviously, they're oppressed, they're ostracized, so no wonder they're doing what they're doing. But when you come to this matter of, uh, you know, this persecution of Christians and really other people, but as, as we can talk along, you'll see it's really the Christians are the number one victims. When you come to this matter, it's very hard for the mainstream media and the liberal narrative to get by because now you're, you're talking about people who are being persecuted absolutely for no other reason than that they are Christians. OK, because these people, uh, let's say the Copts in Egypt, for one example, they're Egyptians, just like the Muslims. They look the same. You can't tell the difference between a Muslim and a Copt, you know, from their physical appearance. They're, they look the same. Of course, it's because the vast majority of Egyptian Muslims were originally Copts, their forebears, before they were compelled to convert for various reasons throughout the medieval, medieval era. But so they're the same race. They speak the same language. Uh, they're the same. They have the same culture. You cannot tell a cop from a Muslim apart in Egypt in any way, shape, or form, other than maybe seeing a cross on the wrist of a cop or seeing them go into church. So we're talking about identical people, and yet all over the Islamic world, they're being attacked 
killed. Their churches are being bombed. I spoke about the cops. You know, we can move to Nigeria. Again, same race, same people, same language, indistinguishable from their Muslim counterparts. Yet not a Sunday goes by without churches being bombed over there. So how can the mainstream narrative really talk about that as opposed to the other examples I gave about, for instance, Muslims, uh, you know, fighting against Israel or in the West and, you know, 9-11 even was articulated as by the mainstream media as well. Look, they're angry for all our sins and what we've done. They're retaliating. But this issue of, you know, attacking a people who are identical to Muslims in every single shape, way and form, except religion, just is, is so difficult to try to, to get by. And of course, the mainstream media gets by it in any number of ways. The, the most pr easiest way, of course, is not to talk about it, not to mention it. And yet, even when it, and they have to mention it, for instance, the more spectacular attacks like the Baghdad bombing, uh, you know, the one that killed nearly 60 people in 2010, or the Alexandria bombing that killed, uh, you know, 23 people, or the Nigerian Christmas and Easter bombings that kill each one about 50 people. So the mainstream media has to talk about it. But when you read it, when you look at the headlines, they'll state the fact in one sentence or two. A, a church was attacked by uh, unnamed, unknown people. And then it'll go on about how the Christians retaliated and how they got angry and they might have attacked and even killed a Muslim. And there was violence. And in the end, you just walk away thinking, it's a, it's oh, it's sectarian strife. It's two equal groups that are just intolerant of each other. And it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, you know Islam or Islamic oh, yeah. teachings. So this, I find that, yeah. th that's very common, isn't it? It seems like uh, at Jihad Watch, when I cover these things um, day by day and you know month after month and year after year, uh, it seems so often that attacks by Muslims against Christians are represented as uh, I I ethnic strife or uh, even yeah. when they say that it's Muslims and Christians fighting each other, uh, there's a tremendous tendency to portray it as if it is uh, both sides are equally to blame. And uh, right. Right. this seems to be something that they are purposely doing because in case after case after case, I see that the, the, you read the story and it's Muslims attacking Christians. And sometimes the Christians yeah. are fighting back, sometimes not. But then the whole thing is represented as if the Christians are just as much at fault as the Muslims. Right. And that's that's what always happens recently in Egypt. I mean, there's so many you, you I mean, on Jihad Watch, you yourself see all of this happening, all the different headlines. And recently in Egypt, uh, you know, a, a church was attacked and, um, you know, bullets were open, fire was open on it, this and that. And then the headline I read, I forget right now, which it was a you know, mainstream media was just sectarian clash in Egypt. And you read it and you just you don't even know who started it. Um, you don't know what's going on, and it just you, if you don't know any better, like most people in America or in the West in general, and, and you go, you take the media's word, it just sounds like, oh, you know, two different sects or ethnicities are fighting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this has such a long paper trail. I mean, consider Sudan. I remember, you know, this the Sudan war went a long time ago, back when we were all younger and when I wasn't as involved in this field. And I too remember I would read it, and it just it didn't say anything about religion, it was yeah. the Arab North. You know, fighting the uh, the uh, the black African South, right? And in reality, they're they're both Africans. The Arab North is called Arab because it's Muslim, and they have and they speak Islam's language, and they name Arab Islamic names, and that's it. And that was really the fundamental aspect to it. And yet, you speak to any well-informed person, it had nothing to do with religion. It was all about you know land and resources and this and that. And the same thing with Lebanon. Uh, the, the, the Lebanese war, you know, you, you don't un, you don't get when you read it, the mainstream narrative that really at root, it was Islamic supremacists trying to subjugate the Christians. It was, again, presented as economic issues. Yeah. And so it's it's just it's amazing how it's being so dissembled by the mainstream media and, of course, politicians. Well, what do you think's in it for them? Why on earth does there seem to be and there obviously does seem to be this concerted effort? I mean, you know, you mentioned Sudan. I remember in those days that uh, Omar Bashir, the uh, leader of Sudan, actually said straight out that this was a jihad that they were waging against the Christians mm -hmm. of the South. And that was mentioned once, you know, I saw it in one report, put it up at Jihad Watch, mm -hmm. that was that. And uh, nobody else yeah. seemed to pick up on it. There was no examination of the implications of the statement. What on earth are they trying to do? Why is it so uh, imperative? on the part of the mainstream media. Why do they think that it's so important that they obfuscate these things? You know, another one, uh, uh, just briefly, is that I see a lot in mainstream media reports about this, is the use of passive voice. 
or the yeah. absence of an actor altogether. Like they say, a bomb exploded in a church, or uh, a church was severely damaged <laughs> by a bomb, but yeah. no hint of just who happens. might have set the bomb off. <laughs> right, it just, just, happened it just happened to be, to be there. Some bomb came out of nowhere. Yeah. So <laughs> I, what on earth, I mean, what, the, what's the, the, the objective? Reason, yeah. The objective, I mean, there's so many different kinds. And I mean, I think every different journalist is is under different, um, you know, has a different motivation, conscious or unconsciously. But I think one of the biggest one is uh, it's a sort of uh, it's it's ironic to me because liberals, if you think about liberals or people who want who are multicultural, people who praise multiculturalism, which would be, let's say, the mainstream media mm -hmm. and liberal, the liberal narrative. If you really think about what they're doing in the context of what you and I are talking about, it is so arrogant and so and so Western cultural centric, even yeah, though they're yeah. the ones who say, you, you see what I'm saying? Because what they're doing is they have an idea of how the world works, which we alluded to earlier, which is basically, you know, violence is never an intrinsic thing. It's a reflection of some grievance. And that, that, that's just a philosophical number one premise, and they build everything on that premise. But when you think about it, think of how, how, how culturally arrogant that is. You and I will agree that Muslims are doing what they're doing because it is distinct to their civilization, let's say, or in the Islamic teachings and doctrines. We can understand that, and in that sense, we are actually giving them their due. In fact, we're respecting them. But when the, we're respecting them as people and as who they are and what they believe, but when you come to this liberal narrative, what they're really doing is they're saying, no, 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 don't. Eat. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they do a, a fatwa about killing Christians or if they articulate it as a jihad. You know, they they really they don't they don't mean that, or they don't. Yeah. If if only we could help them and give them more money and resources, I'm sure all that will fall away. So consider the arrogance involved in that. It's basically saying my epistemology of how things work is really the whole world's epistemology, and the only difference is. These people are still a little backwards, and once they see the light, once they understand the the, the world I do, which is in a very materialistic sense, then surely they too will stop doing this. So oh, I absolutely. think that is a big part of it, and it's arrogance. Yeah, it's this is the very important. Thing. They're the ones who praise. Yeah, it's a it's a huge. They're the ones who are praising. Point, um, yeah. I'm uh, yeah. reminded of uh, something that I put up at Jihad Watch today. Of course, the day that this airs is going to be. This will be uh, a few weeks in the past, but. Uh, we are taping today, uh, whatever day it is, April 4th, and uh, there is this interview uh, in Wired, uh, the online magazine, of uh, Omar Hamami, the American jihadist from Alabama who is fighting jihad in Somalia, and Spencer Ackerman of Wired, who is the, uh, the, the leftist journalist who uh, did a series of exposés a few years back, you may remember Raymond, who uh, he was the guy who uh, suddenly discovered that FBI training materials and training materials for Homeland Security and for Joint Terrorism Task Force and so on were full of the truth about Islam and Jihad, including writings by you and by me. And he, mm -hmm. they, he got the, uh, he was able to uh, start off this whole firestorm in the media, which ultimately led the Obama administration to purge the truth about Islam and Jihad from all the training mm -hmm. materials. But in any case, today he's interviewing Omar Hamami, and he says, uh, what is uh, an example of a current Jihad Khalifa pursuit done right way? And uh, the, uh, the Jihadist Omar Hamami answers, well, it's, uh, it's fighting is, is part of the religion, and uh, Spencer Ackerman can't handle that. And he says, fighting is part of your religion, you mean? or the U.S. religion, in quotes, lurking behind the foreign policy. And uh, Omar Hamami says it again, U.S. policy is the factor defining specific target, but fighting is part of the religion. And so Spencer Ackerman still won't get it, refuses to get it, and comes back and says, so would it be correct to understand you feel compelled to fight given U.S. foreign policy? Well, no, it's not about U.S. foreign policy at all. This guy's trying to tell him I'm fighting because of my religion. But Spencer Ackerman, the leftist journalist, just cannot, will not accept that yeah. and continues to press him to say, no, I'm just fighting because of U.S. foreign policy. It's a, it's a quintessential example of what you're saying, that these, these analysts in the West are imposing their view of these things onto the jihadis, mm -hmm. which is a very arrogant, ethnocentric, paternalistic right. uh, thing to do. Right. And they're the ones who are claiming we, have, we can't be this way, we have to be taught, we have to accept all cultures, all cultures are equal. 
Think about that. Isn't that the whole idea of multiculturalism, this yeah. relevancy that all cultures are equal? Well, if that's the case, then you should believe that that is their culture. And yet it just it, it seems like, you know, they, he, they can't transcend their own box. They're in a box. You know, they think in a box. This is what they believe. And anything out of that box is not real. I don't care how many times you insist it and how many times you say it. I don't care how much documentation you show me. You know, uh, one way or another, you're going to have to see it my way because my way is the right way. And, and look at the arrogance in that. And yet, so you and I actually, who might be accused of, you know, not of 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 being the opposite, not res not being multicultural, we're the ones who are actually giving their due, giving them their due. We take them at their word. I believe them. I respect them enough to believe that what they say is what they believe. And so look at this grand irony. And now you got these people who are in charge of informing the West and America about what's going on. And yet they just can't even escape their own thought patterns. And t I mean, like you're saying, how many times do these jihadists, how many times must they articulate it nonstop what they believe? what they're doing, you know, yeah. and, and quote it. And, and yet, no, we still, you know, we, we don't get it. That can't be like you're saying he's, he has to somehow pin it on American foreign policy. He can't just take his way. And, and here he is, he's saying it, you know, he's saying, no, this is our teaching. It's the same thing with Al Qaeda as, as I did in the Al Qaeda reader. I mean, time and again, when they're speaking to Muslims, they point out in the end, America is our enemy, irrespective of what foreign policies they follow, because our teach our religion teaches, and they write this, every infidel has three choices either submit to the sword of islam or or be or con convert or become a dhimmi or go to war and yeah, and this is Muhammad. and this thing has been spoken for 1400 years yeah. and we have documentation of it like a long paper trail like, you know miles long and yet here we are and we just don't get it we can't transcend our own liberal you know material it's and this is the other part it's a very materialistic worldview that the west subscribes to which is to say that anything that is other than material metaphysical, which would be, for instance, ideologies like jihadi ideology is not real. All that is real is the physical, the tangible. And so what they're saying can't be real because obviously what is real is they're angry about something tangible, which is land and territory, let's say vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Yeah. Uh, that's why that narrative makes perfect sense with the media, for instance. And so not only is the truth not allowed, but if you speak the truth, then you're a hateful, Islamophobic, anti-Muslim, racist bigot. Right. And, and that's that's the level we've gotten to now where, you know, speaking the truth, uh, it, it, the truth doesn't matter anymore. OK, what matters is that you say what's right, what's politically correct. I mean, it all boils down to really political correctness. And, and so because of this political correctness, as you well know, we are completely paralyzed. And, yeah, it, you know, facts, f facts don't matter. You know, who cares about it? because, hey, you know, your truth is uh, not his truth. You know, that whole sort of whacked out uh, post existential type thinking. And so now there's no truth. It's basically what I say, what you say, what I feel, what you feel, what they feel. And we can't go from there. And, and it amazes me. Uh, and I really discuss this in, in my book, uh, Crucified Again, in the beginning. I have a, a, a chapter called Lost History. And I really discuss how, I mean, so much of what's happening to Christians today, and that's a big part of the book, I demonstrate the continuity. So I show, for instance, the historical uh, uh, forms of persecution, let's say church attacks, abduction of women, uh, apostasy attacks, this and that, and I document them throughout history. And then I show what's happening today, and it's identical. It is, I mean, you, can re you feel like you're reading the same exact story, the same pattern, mirror, identical. And so here we have this vast continuity and they're saying that what happened in the seventh century is what happened is what's happening in the 21st century. And yet, and, and if you would have spoken to someone a couple of hundred years ago, a European, if you would have spoken to a child, he would understand it, it, I mean, it, it's, it's common sense. And this is the problem. We've jettisoned common sense because common sense, it might say something that's not right or wrong. And so we can't talk about it. As you know, that one, uh, is it that one? Um, you know, there was a, a recent hearing. <laughs> this this always amazes me because it's so surreal. I know you're familiar. You might know the names, but it was a hearing, and there was some Obama administration from Homeland Security, and uh, oh, Lundgren, I think, was the chairman, and he kept asking him, "Okay, can we? Can you say that we are at war with radical Islamist extremism?" Okay, <laughs> he didn't say with Islam, and that man could not, in any way, shape, or form, who was at the hearing, associate even Al Qaeda. He wouldn't associate Al Qaeda with a warped, perverse, radical Islamist interpretation. Okay. And so now, I mean, think of how uh, there's no common sense. This man is, I mean, what he is saying is what a child from a few generations or centuries ago in the West 
would have caught up on way before he came. So here's a perfect example of the paralysis that's going on. And even at the hearing, you can see just the, the, the chairman just staring at him because he wouldn't give him, uh, he, he asked him, you're probably familiar with this, he says uh, about Nadal Hassan, he says he had a, a card that says Soldier of Allah. And he goes, well, is that an indicator? Because he said Soldier of Allah, that this is a radical Islamist extremism. And he wouldn't even, uh, he wouldn't even concede to that. So it's just it's amazing the 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 over the lack of common sense that we now have and that our top leaders and analysts and of course the mainstream media are peddling, which has result resulted in in an alternate reality. So now okay. what you see and what you read in mainstream media has nothing to do with reality. It's but the antithesis of the mainstream of it, media. Reasons. Okay, I understand that the mainstream media might be guided by a, uh, a this this ridiculous sense of multiculturalism that has this works from this constant paradigm that uh, non-white, non-Western, non-Christian people are always the victims and can't ever be portrayed as anything but the victims and that they run every news story through this paradigm. And this is one of the reasons why they obfuscate the uh, persecution of Christians by Muslims. But Raymond, uh, what about the government? I mean, I, I'm, I am very well familiar with the things that you're discussing and there are many others. I can recall uh, Thomas Perez, who was uh, in Homeland Security at that time, uh, and or the Defense Department, one of them. In any case, he's now the Secretary of Labor. And he was confronted by a uh, legislator who asked him if he would guarantee that the, oh, he was the Assistant Attorney General, I believe it was. In any case, he, he, uh, he was asked if he could guarantee that the U.S. would never try to, the Obama administration would never try to uh, bring in laws criminalizing criticism of a religion. Because, of course, we know the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, is, has undertaken a massive years-long effort to try to compel the United States and the West to criminalize criticism of Islam. And Thomas Perez would not assure the legislators that the Obama administration would never try to criminalize criticism of Islam. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I understand that the, the, the mainstream media, these leftist journalists, they don't really realize what they're dealing with or what they're getting into. But what on earth is the problem with the U.S. government? What is going on in the Obama administration? Yeah. Well, you ask, you ask a great question, which I actually address. Uh, it's one thing for the media, like you're saying, to do this because, well, they're the media. And it's one thing for, uh, you know, the masses of Americans and Westerners to, know, to not know any better because they're, they're dependent on the media. But when you come to the government and you come to the White House and the Obama administration, now we're talking about people who have access to the best and most accurate intelligence. OK, so Obama need not be listening to CNN when it comes to Islam. OK, he needs to be listening to the analysts, the intelligence that's coming forth. And I know regardless of what the White House and the Obama administration may be, there's a lot of great workers in, in, in the intelligence community and that are faithfully working to actually uh, you know, bring the, the true information. So the, the, the Obama administration has access to the kind of information that would make, I would, I would believe, crystal clear what we're talking about, because it's supposed to be objective. Or at the very least, I mean, let's say a lot of these analysts are also affected by this sort of liberal paradigm. But it's, I'm sure it's going to be a little better than, of course, watching CNN. So the Obama administration knows better. And yet, why, what are they doing? So what they're doing is, on the one hand, they are exploiting or taking advantage of the mainstream media narrative because they like it, of course. So they will further it. They will they will do this. They, they will maintain that narrative because that's what everyone hears in America and it works for them. But then, like you're saying, so why are they doing this? And then you think about, for instance, the Arab Spring. OK, so the media portrayed that as this wonderful, great thing. I, sh I would think the Obama or the uh, or the government would know better. I mean, there's a reason why for decades American politicians and presidents supported dictators, okay? And the reason is they knew what the alternative would be. Everyone knew that. If the dictators go, who was the group that was always fighting against the autocrats? It was always the jihadis. It wasn't very, I mean, of course, there were liberal, secular-minded people throughout the Arab and Islamic world who don't like dictators either. But the governments and the West always was aware that it's known, I mean, you probably know the saying, you know, one vote, one time, one ruler. And that's what would happen when you have a democracy with a, you know, a radical Islamic person taking over, which is what we're seeing in the Arab Spring right now. So that was not something that wasn't known. And the Obama administration must have known that. And yet they wholesale use the liberal narrative that the Arab Spring is basically 
just you know all of these uh, all the arab world is like, again it's that it's that arrogance the whole arab world are revolting because they want to be just like us they want liberal secular democracy once we get rid of mubarak once we get rid of gaddafi once we get rid of assad you know all of a sudden it'll become jeffersonian democracy in the in the middle in the middle east now the mainstream media of course said that but again the government knows better than that so what are they doing obviously they have their agenda they're enabling in other words they know what is going to happen they know it's what we're seeing today in these countries where the arab spring has come and now we're seeing it become a nightmare especially for christian people and minorities and women and basically even even muslims who don't follow the the jihadi islamist agenda and so everyone knew this and but they did it and and there's another point i'd like to add specifically about obama Barack Obama. It's ironic because when I think to myself, okay, let's let's stick to this Christian persecution idea. You probably know that it's really gotten worse progressively. Let's say it, it's always, of course, been there, but let's say starting around the 60s and the 70s, it started getting worse, and now it's reached a fever pitch. So, in that sense, it's understandable that former American presidents would not have been really cognizant about the idea of Christian persecution because during their era, it really wasn't happening anywhere near like it's happening now. During their era. Even the government didn't have the sort of intelligence that we have now. I mean, there was no internet, for instance. So it's understandable. Now we come to Barack Obama, where we're living in an era where per Christian persecution and jihadi activity has, is just so obvious. It's so open, and it's and it's it's increased manifold compared to what it was in former generations. And then on add on top of that, Barack Hussein Obama, the man, is who is always portrayed as very intelligent, has a he was educated in Indonesian madrasas, Islamic schools, and his father is uh, is a Muslim from Kenya. Now, what that tells me is, at the very least, it tells me he, of all presidents, has an, should have an intimacy with what's really happening in those countries. He should know better than, let's say, a George Bush, because he, he has personal acquaintance with these regions. He knows he should know what's going on, even even regardless of what intelligence communities tell him. And yet, of an all presidents, point. he is the uh, one. Raymond, we've, we're, we're coming to the midway yeah. point. We've got to take a break. Uh, this is very important okay. material about Obama, and we will return to it right after this. I am Robert Spencer, and this is ABN's Jihad Watch program. We're here with the renowned and notorious Raymond Ibrahim, and we'll be right back after this. You are watching ABN. Hi, this is David Wood from Jesus or Muhammad. Uh, as I'm sure you've heard, ABN uh, has some significant financial needs. Uh, a lot of the equipment here is either outdated or damaged, and it's affecting the broadcast. I'll say ABN does a great job with what they have, but uh, they could be doing much more if they had uh, some uh, newer equipment, some newer cameras. Um, and so I encourage everyone to uh, support the work that's going on here. We'd like to have more broadcasts, more shows, more programs, and uh, we can only do that uh, through financial donations. And so I encourage everyone out there uh, to contribute whatever you can. Um, and uh, beyond all of this, uh, apart from the, the, the technical uh, needs, there's also the security needs given the increase in threats. And so uh, if ABN is going to continue carrying on this work, they're going to need your support as they always have. And so uh, as, you, uh, you know, as we end out the year and you're thinking uh, about where you'd like to donate, uh, I don't think you'll find a better place than ABN.
evening and welcome back to ABN's Jihad Watch program. I am Robert Spencer and we're here with Raymond Ibrahim who has a new book out called Crucified Again about the persecution of Christians by Muslims in the Islamic world based on Islamic texts and teachings. Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. Get yours, get five copies for your friends, relatives, neighbors. Uh, this is a message that needs to get out. It is not getting out. It is truth that needs to be told. Uh, the plight of these people is an international human rights scandal that is being ignored by the world human rights community. And uh, Raymond, we were discussing before the break Barack Obama and how he, of all presidents, should know and certainly does know the realities of Islam, having been raised as a Muslim according to his school records in Indonesia and uh, by his own account uh, getting in trouble for making faces in Quran class the Christian students in Indonesia didn't go to Quran class. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that Barack Obama is a secret Muslim or something like that, but there's no doubt that he has a Muslim background and that uh, clearly by the, uh, the uh, uh, foreign policy that he's pursued, he has a great affection for, respect for, regard for Islam, seems to think that it's a good ordering for society. And so uh, what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis his attitude toward this persecution of Christians? He, of all presidents, is the most who is indifferent to it, who wants to cover it up. He'll throw a couple of words here and there. But his, his again, you, you know, you will you know them by their fruits, not their words. So whatever he says is one thing. But look at his actions by by supporting, for instance, this Arab spring. I mean, look at what he did in Libya. You know, we he we knew Al Qaeda, not just radical Islamic jihadis or Al Qaeda, the group that attacked and killed Americans was operating in Libya. And what did he do? He supported them. And the reward the U.S. got was, of course, the consulate attack and, and, the, and the killing of uh, an ambassador and, and several other U.S. employees. And so, I mean, go figure. And it was done and it was planned on September 11. And then, of course, he tried to dissemble it and blame it on, on free speech once again uh, by blaming it on the movie. But to just kind of like to highlight this issue of who and what I'm thinking, what I'm trying to say about Obama is that let's compare him quickly to George Bush. So George Bush went to liberate Iraq from Saddam Hussein. And I really believe that someone like George Bush, based on his background, i.e. absolutely no, um, no personal knowledge of, let's say, the Islamic world, would, of course, listen to his advisors and the mainstream media and just be convinced that once they get democracy, things will be fine. But now you go to Barack Obama, who, like you said, you know, he went to Islamic schools. He knows what's being taught. He understands the, the sort of supremacist theology involved. I, I, compare him, I, I compare him somewhat, somewhat to myself in a bit because I'm born and raised in the U.S., but my parents are from Egypt. Raymond. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> but, but anyway, yes. So my parents, Born in the U.S. Yes, my, sir. Uh, sorry for the levity. Go ahead. Done, yeah. <laughs> so born in the U.S. and my parents are from Egypt. Now, just based on that fact alone, I've, I, I, I almost want to say I have an innate understanding, better than, of course, your average American, of that area. Of course, I've lived in, and visited it many times also, just like he's lived in Indonesia. So just on that alone, aside from, let's say, reading or studying or, or understanding, you know, the Islamic world has imparted to me a more personal kind of acquaintance that I know that I can't just say, oh, it's not real. So I'm convinced this sort of thing is this this acquaintance is such that Obama has it as well. So he he way more than 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 Bush who we can say naively was convinced that throwing Saddam Hussein would all of a sudden bring, you know, democracy and, and secularism. He knows better than that. And yet he did the same exact thing and he's doing it. And despite all the evidence, we can say that at the time of the Iraq war, we really didn't know because most of the Islamic world was already under dictatorships, et cetera. So we couldn't really say what will happen. You know, the examples are very small. But with Iraq, we've seen what happened to the Christians, for example. They've been decimated. Now that Iraq's been liberated, especially in 2004, I mean, almost like half the churches were bombed and it continues going so that more than half of the Christians are either gone or dead. So there was a paradigm and a precedent that someone like Obama should have been aware of. But instead of that, he just went wholesale supporting open jihadis everywhere. Look at in Syria. He's supporting the, the jihadis who just recently issued a fatwa telling the opposition they can rape Syrian women because, you know, they're infidels. And these are the people we, under the Obama administration, are supporting. So obviously, to go to your point, he has an agenda, or we can, we can say either he just doesn't care 
about what are the repercussions of minorities and women and, and every non-radical Muslim, or, or, or I mean, it might be even more nefarious than that, that he's basically trying to enable and empower. Because what we're seeing, what it, this is the first step. The Arab Spring, if you follow what they're saying, in Egypt, in, Le in Libya, in all these countries, the idea isn't just to be liberated. The idea, the next idea is to form, is to, is to combine and become a caliphate. And, that, and they say that all the time. This is, again, one of those things that they say as much as the West ignores. Why and so that's the grand plan. For the, and what, uh, for the uh, viewers who may not be familiar with the concept, tell us exactly what a caliphate is and what the implications of its reestablishment would be. Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. The caliphate, of course, began, is uh, it, it comes from the word khalifa, which just means successor. So after Muhammad died, Abu Bakr became the first khalifa or caliph. And a, so a caliphate is basically a, a, the, a, an empire that is run by the successor of Muhammad. And its ultimate function was basically expansion and growth. And this is why after Muhammad died and Abu Bakr, what did Abu Bakr do? He went and slaughtered all the Arabs who once Muhammad died, they figured, okay, this Islam thing's done. We can leave it now. And Abu Bakr said no. And it's interesting. Most people aren't aware of this, but you're probably familiar with the Riddha Wars, the apostasy wars sure. that occurred in, in, in right yes, between 632 and 634 under Abu Bakr. And most people think it's just because these uh, Arabs who are Muslims stopped being Muslim. It, w it wasn't just that, actually. They said, we're willing to do your prayers. We're willing to even you know go along with the gag, but we don't want to pay the tithes anymore, the zakat. And that alone was enough for Abu Bakr to launch a massive jihad that saw tens of thousands of Arabs mutilated, crucified, and tortured to death because they wouldn't give money to empower the, ca the caliphate and make it grow and become stronger. And then after that, of course, the second, the, the second caliph, Omar, went on. The, he, he totally expanded, and it was under his reign that the jihad went into Egypt and Libya, all the way down eventually into Spain. And so the ca caliphate's function is to basically conquer non-Muslim territories. The caliph was actually, as you know, you know, the five pillars of Islam, the most important basically is prayer and, uh, and fasting. And the caliph was, he had a dispensation. He didn't have to do those things because he had to wage jihad every year. So if the time yeah. came for him to wage jihad, he, he doesn't have to do those things. So that just, that highlights how important the idea behind the caliphate of waging jihad to subsume non-Muslim territories is. And this that was the history of Islam. Important, Raymond, I should just add at this yeah. point that uh, the, in traditional Sunni Islamic law, it is the caliph's responsibility to declare offensive jihad. And he has the obligation to declare offensive jihad at regular intervals. And if he doesn't, he can be removed from his position. Uh, offensive right. jihad is simply that. It's declaring war on a non-Muslim state in order to bring it under the rule of Islamic law to either to Islamize the uh, people there or to subjugate them as dhimmis. And the uh, caliph is the only one who is authorized to declare offensive jihad. All the jihads in the world today, and ever since the abolition of the caliphate in 1924 by the secular Turkish government, have been defensive. Uh, that's why, that's actually one of the things that confuses Western analysts because they look at the writings of somebody like Osama bin Laden, as in your Al-Qaeda reader, and they see that uh, he's explaining why they fight on the basis of all these grievances. And then they think, oh, we, if we just redress all these grievances, then the Muslims will love us and everything will be okay. But that's actually a tremendous misconception. O Osama was retailing all the grievances in order to justify his jihad as defensive, because defensive jihad is an obligation on all Muslims, according to Islamic law, if an Islamic land is attacked. And offensive jihad, however, can only be declared by the caliph. So one of the main goals of the, re of the jihad movement worldwide is to reestablish the caliphate so that offensive jihad exactly. can be waged. Exactly. So that is when they talk about a caliphate in the West, you know, oh, what's wrong with that? They just want to be united. <laughs> you know, just like we're a united bloc. We're the United States. Some, some Muslims, they'll actually, in Egypt, will call, we want a united uh, Islamic state, you know, yeah. so they kind of euphemize and use these terms that the West thinks, hey, that sounds great. But in, in the end, what it is, is, of course, is the caliphate. And um, and the other option or the other idea when you were pointing out the caliph's job, of course, is to wage a jihad is, of course, that's only when he can. So now we're also at a point where Muslims are not in a position, aside from the technicality of not having 
the caliph, but they're just not physically and materially capable of actually going, let's say, into Europe and conquering it by arms, okay, a full-on jihad. So what they are permitted to do, of course, is to have the hudna or truces with Israel, with everyone else, which are basically a truce that is, I'm going to go to peace with you. I'm, a, you know, the Palestinians are at peace with Israel. They have a peace treaty. Why? Because they, they, that's the best option for them, because they can't win anyway at, arm, at an armed conflict. But once they can, of course, the hudna is abrogated and the jihad resumes. And all these little th important things are just missed. And so if, you know, you get a, you know, Camp David or, or any Oslo Accords and all of a sudden it's like, oh, look, we have peace. And yet you read what they're saying. Arafat himself, you recall, he even pointed out, he said, what were, this is, this is the Hudayba, just like the, which we, was a precedent with Muhammad, where he basically made a treaty with the pagans. And then when the time came, he was strong enough. He used an excuse to break it and went on a jihad and conquered them. And so it, it's just, it mind boggles me how we have so many precedents. We have all the connections, the dots are connected and it's, and, and they're saying it. I mean, I wish they weren't even, if, if I said they're always lying, you know, and they're dissembling like, like the Muslim brotherhood, yeah, yeah. you can say, all right, well, yeah. But the Salafi group, this is why I always say people listen to the Salafis because these are the guys who are the most forthright people about the true teachings of Islam. They have no, they have no shame and they'll say it and you, and you hear them and the things they say are way worse than anything you and I can say they say. And yet Absolutely. all of the and here it is from their own mouth, from their own mouth. And you know, nobody, oh, it's it's again, it's that arrogance. No, they it, it's it's ironic. It's like a vicious circle. It's almost like the worst a Muslim acts, the more intolerant, the more vicious he becomes, the more that prompts the West to say he has a true grievance. <laughs> you yeah. know, oh look, look how really angry he is. Therefore, we got to do more to make him happy. And yeah. so, and then it's amazing because then the more the West does, the more re that really earns contempt from Muslims because they see this, you know, a, a kind of servile, uh, you know, giving in, appeasing, and that just makes them more demands, more violence, which then makes the West feel like it has to give in more. And it's just, it's, it's absurd. It is indeed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how you're saying that they, we have all this. It's all out there. You know, they, they're saying it openly. And these things are not uh, not new. You mentioned the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and that sets the the framework for all Islamic treaties according to Islamic law. Ever after that, and that was when Muhammad, in a position of weakness, concluded a treaty with the pagan Quraysh, and it was for ten years. And uh, then he broke it when he was strong enough and didn't need it anymore. And so it is part of Islamic law now that you can make a treaty for a period of up to ten years if you are in a position of weakness and need to gather your strength to fight again more effectively. And yet, again and again and again, Western analysts, and especially in regard to Israel and the Palestinian jihadis, they invoke uh, the idea that we can make a truce as if it's going to be a truce in Western terms, as if both sides right. equally want peace and both sides will use the time of the truce to uh, to try to hammer out some kind of more effective and more lasting peace agreement, when actually this has never been the understanding of a truce in, Islam, in the Islamic world ever since the traditions about Muhammad were formulated. And it's, uh, it's astonishing, really, that the, the willful ignorance and the blindness on the part of the American military and intelligence community. It's just, it's, it's really sad. And I mean, it, you know, I was watching an Egyptian program and the other day, and they made a very good point, which I think is applicable to us in the West. And as you know, in Egypt, you have the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis, and they have their strong agenda and they're in power. And then you have the more liberal, secular, nominal Muslims and cops and others who are resisting. And so a lot of these programs, I watch them that are, you know, from the secular, like the Basim Yusuf type people. And, um, one guy just the other day, he basically said, I mean, we, as in the Egyptian secular media, are telling you every day what they're doing, what they're up to, which is just the stuff we're talking about. And you, the viewers, a lot of you, of course, sympathize and you don't like it, but they continue doing it anyway. And it's kind of, it's gotten to the point where we, so it's like you and I, you know, we say, we do, we write, we document, we expose and people, a lot in America and elsewhere, sympathize, agree, and yet the government does what it's going to do, and it just keeps going. And it's, it's so it's very frustrating in that sense because it's gotten to the point where it's it, it, it's 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 auto, it's a dictatorship. I mean, we know that in the Islamic world, but it's becoming that basically in the U.S. where you have a, a group, you know, an administration 
that it just has its own agenda, its own belief, and the whole, you know, no, no matter who's against it, no matter the evidence, all they have to do is say, oh, no, that's 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 a misunderstanding or, or that's a hoax, and they just do their own thing. So it's it's gotten to the point, and that's why I really ultimately think it's it's we need something more than to just document facts. I mean, we need to actually change <laughs> as as monumental a task as it sounds, the Western world view, because until that's corrected, no matter how much evidence is given, it's just going to somehow either be rationalized, ignored, distorted. But once you have, and this is why I always say this Islam, this global Islam problem would be a non-problem if common sense was actually in work. And this is why when and during the colonial era, when the uh, when Europe became a lot stronger than the Islamic world, you know, Islam, it was over. Mm -hmm. All is Muslims, you know what they wanted to do? To become like the West. Mm -hmm. Their whole thing was how can we emulate the victorious West? Why is that? Because Muslims respect power. That is the whole story of Islam. You know, might makes right, and Islam is the embodiment of might. I join Islam, I become more powerful, I'm better than the dhimmi, I'm enriched, I have plunder, I have slaves, whatever the case may be. And then when they got defeated, uh, you know, let's starting really with Napoleon in 1798, Battle of Pyramids, what happened then is actually a very a turning towards the West. But why was that? Because the West at the time actually respected its own self, was proud of its own ways, and it didn't it didn't apologize for them because there was no multiculturalism at that point. So when when Muslims saw this, they actually sought to emulate it. And this is the the golden age era for Christians, for example. You know, let's say around between 1850 till you know recent or 1950 or so. When Mo this is when Muslims didn't have the beards anymore, and this is when they started wearing suits, and this is when they started becoming very Western oriented, and and really copying the West. But then what happened is, far from becoming this this uh, you know something to aspire to and to look up to, the West started loathing itself, hating itself, lost its own moral restraint, and that only caused the Muslim world actually to begin having contempt for the West and going back to its own roots. And so that's kind of what we're seeing. But this is why I'm saying if you go back a couple of hundred years ago, I mean, th this problem would not even exist without anyone doing anything. Why? Because the West actually was governed by a different set of principles and it had a very different worldview, one that did not appease, one that did not uh, you know, denigrate its own values, one that did not praise others. And now that it's doing all that, all it's doing is earning contempt and disgust from Muslims and validation, basically validation that, yeah, we're doing the right thing. Look, even the West is telling us to do this. And so this is this is really the situation where we're at, where we've gotten to the point, truth, facts, documents. Hey, I mean, we can have mountains. We do have mountains and they still don't do much because there's something wrong up here. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about that. So how do we get back, Raymond? Uh, you know, I. This is the eternal question, and I don't know that there's any easy answer, but uh, in our time remaining, maybe we can try to sketch out some things. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, your analysis is spot on that the West has uh, lost its self-confidence, lost its sense of self, lost its way, lost respect for the Judeo-Christian civilization, lost respect for the universal principles of human rights that it gave to the world okay. and that are accepted around the world, except in Sharia states and in the Islamic world generally. How do we get back? What, what, what can we do now to try to stem this tide and turn the direction back around? Well, I believe what we can do is what you and I and many others do, of course, is just continue exposing, spreading the word, you know, engaging in activism, because the more you do that, the more you get. And that's the whole point. I'm not, I'm not really blaming Americans as much, because a lot of them, of course, see things the way we see it. A lot of them, that is to say, still have common sense. But the problem is we have this, uh, you know, these powers, we have academia, we have the media, we have the government, and they're the ones who have the ultimate voice. And all of them are on the other side, really. Okay, not all, but basically, you know, in general, they're, they're, they're the ones that are propagating this myth, you know, this alternate reality. So basically, I think, you know, we, we do what we got to do, but I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Because historically, you know, when people become decadent, it takes nothing, they, they have to be attacked. And we did get attacked on 9-11. And uh, we had flags, American flags on our cars for a week. And now it's gone. And now it's forgotten. And now it's our fault again. So I think what's going to have to get, <laughs> this is not what I want, but I think it's going to continue going the way it's going until you probably do have a caliphate and you do have an offensive. And you got to understand, and here's another thing about you know the, the jihadi mentality. You know, we always think of the balance of power. So I have nu nuclear powers, you have nuclear powers, but we love life. We're not going to use them until absolute worst. 
uh, scenario. But as you know, as jihadis love to boast, we love death as you love life. And I believe that. And so when these groups have these weapons, they will use it because these are people who are, who are, whose mentality is so much different than ours in that they actually are out to bring the Mahdi. They're out to see, you know, to have it so that every Jew behind the tree <laughs> is being killed because the tree is exposing him. They believe this. This is not just something that, uh, you know, is, is this thing. So when the, that's what I think will eventually probably happen. They're going to continue getting stronger. A lot of people like you and I and many others will comp- continue exposing and saying what's going on. The vast majority are being fed by the mainstream media and the government will just be like, you know, going along with, with that narrative until another... See, 9-11 was just the beginning, okay? But I think a lot of Muslims and, G- and jihadis understood that it was actually mis- it was wrong. It was a wrong timing because it enabled people like you and me to start doing what we're doing in that it, people woke up for a little bit. But I think what's going to happen now is, is, is more of the stealth jihad, which you know so well. And that's going to be going on for a while until, and that's, this is what's going on. The Arab Spring is the stealth jihad and trying to basically unify and then have the caliphate. And then once they are ready, you will have that major offensive jihad we were talking about. And then hopefully at that point, people will be able to make a difference. I hate to be so pessimistic, but I really, well, you know, I mean, this the situation is, how I, I, is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that sugarcoating yeah. it. It gets us anywhere. You know, a lot of times when I speak around the country, people say, can't you give us anything encouraging? Can't you end up with a positive note? And, you know, I understand the desire for that, but it's also a temptation to uh, uh, console oneself with half-truths and distortions just because they're more pleasant to deal with than the realities. Uh, I don't think that uh, the uh, free people are down for the count or that uh, free civilizations are going to vanish from the earth. I think that uh, you're absolutely right, personally, that it's uh, going to get a lot worse before it gets better, and that uh, we have an uphill battle. But uh, it ain't over till it's over, as the great philosopher Yogi Berra right. said. And uh, you know, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that the Islamic world is also so weak and brittle. Uh, look, for example, at the fury against people who tell the truth about Islam, at the, at the desperate attempts to shut us down. And, uh, this manifests a tremendous insecurity, as if they know that mm-hmm. what we're saying is true, and they're desperate to avoid being exposed. That is not the uh, the kind the sign of a confident culture striding into victory. And so, uh, you know, I, I, it's not as if all is lost here by any means, because the Western openness to questioning and to investigation, I think, is always going to win out against this uh, thuggish suppression of. Uh, of, of free inquiry. No, I agree with you. I mean, and again, that's that's why I differentiate, you know, people, you know, the Americans and Westerners. I mean, my understanding, if you really think about it, I think I saw a poll or I don't know how accurate, but I think most people are agree with our view about oh, yeah. it. The question is, are they are, are they in a position to make a difference? And that's the problem. Exactly. So, you know, it's a difference between we know and we want to. And then there's the powers that be who are not. You know, and and that's that's this is the problem. How we're gonna, so it, I mean, it's it's probably gonna get, I mean, it's gonna get into, I don't want to say a civil war, but there's gonna be a very vast ideological divide in America, much more than it is now. I mean, I don't even consider it a, a, a divide really, but there's gonna be such a, 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 a you know a different world view that there's gonna be a conflict, because as you know, the liberals are not going to give it up either they're not just because uh, you know, they're, they're the most ones who for all the peace and tolerance and multiculturalism they speak as i pointed out they do the exact opposite so they will have no compunction of engaging in violence just to stay in power and how will they justify it they're doing it for the good for, of humanity it's a you know it's it's, it's a marxist mentality kind of oh know. absolutely so, very much so yeah i mean look at obama you know it's, we've been talking a lot about obama's attachment to Islam, but there's also no doubt that uh, throughout his career, starting with his uh, announcement of his very first political campaign in Bill Ayer's living room, uh, he has been associated with uh, uh, radical Marxists, communists, and uh, this doesn't Mm -hmm. seem to be any problem for him. And so we see, in Mm -hmm. a certain sense, his presidency as the embodiment of the alliance between the left and Islamic supremacism that expresses itself in so many ways around the world and in the United States today. And that and, and, and part of my pessimism is from the fact that, you know, he got elected again. 
You know, so yeah. you would have thought that, okay, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. It's kind of shame on me. Oh, absolutely. So, and that's, 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 that's the situation where we're at. And, uh, and what, and what bothers me, and you know, this too, is a lot of the conservatives and Republicans, you know, they, they, they're really following the same narrative and they, you know, they'll, they'll be a smidgen better, but it's the same idea. I mean, how many oh, yeah. really, uh, uh, conservative uh, politicians are on full board with sort of the thing that we're presenting here. I know there are very some. Very few. There are the some. The overwhelming very majority. Few, you're right. Yeah, very few. So, so even can, the you alternative. Know, Raymond, we're about out of time, but one thing we can okay. leave is, is the, uh, as a takeaway from this, I hope that all of you watching this will keep it in mind that this should be something you should be pressuring your elected officials about. Alert them to the Muslim persecution of Christians. Demand that they speak about it in Congress and the Senate. Uh, this is something that we have to do because they're not doing it and uh, we have to make sure that they do or that they be held accountable at the ballot box. And if we don't do this, right. then uh, one thing we can be sure of is that things are not going to get better. Uh, Raymond Ibrahim, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. Be sure to get Raymond's book, Crucified Again, a vitally important book today. And this has been ABN's Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer. Thank you for watching. Good night and God bless.